Hi everyone, it's Marissa Williams, author of Eerily Easy English. Um, today we're going to go through writing dialogue and I'm just going to kind of talk and follow along with my writing from my book. So writing dialogue is basically just conversation. So what are people thinking and saying? How are they saying it? Are they saying it with an inflection? Do they use slang terms? Do they have an authority figure voice? Is it a child? So you wanna take that age of the character into consideration because a child is not gonna use those big words like, uh, like a scholar would, right? So, I mean, unless the child's a child prodigy. They're more likely to use simple phrases. I want this, let's play, stuff like that. Whereas an adult might use bigger, more complex sentences as well as scholars and those educated types like doctors and stuff, right? So Mark Twain and Irving Welsh are a couple of authors that have used phonetic spelling. Phonetic is how it's spelled out as opposed to how it sounds in the dictionary. So this can show kind of a little bit of inflection in the voice. Um, Mark Twain was an American writer, however, Irving Welsh is a Scottish writer. So when Irving Welsh writes, he has a Scottish dialect that is reflected. So very much different style than Mark Twain. However, both of them do show how people would talk in their area at that time period, right? So that's how the best dialogue reflects what people would actually say. But as an author, you want to be discriminating. Sometimes less is more. So you want to have conversations that actually move the forward, the story forward, as opposed to just, um, uh, well, uh, I don't know. It, you know, it, that's boring. Who needs that? It's not moving the story, story, the story forward. Instead, Alfred Hitchcock says that a good story is life with the dull parts taken out. So. Again, don't bore the reader with stuff that's unnecessary. Stick to the good parts. And sometimes that action says more than words, right? All right, double quotes. People love to confuse these. Double quotes are usually around what people say. Now, there's usually a comma between the quote and that double, uh, I'm sorry, the double quote um, and the space of where they start speaking. So in the first one, let's look at that. It says, I am tired comma inside of those double quotes he said right so again in american writing those commas go inside of the quotation marks let's see another example you would not be tired if you did not stay up so late she remarked again notice that commas inside of the double quote marks and if a quotation takes up more than one paragraph Use closing quotations only where the character is done speaking, not at the end of each line or paragraph. So he said, he glared at her, you know why I was up so late, comma, he shook his head. Don't pretend like you forgot, you were the reason I had to stay up so late. Now notice at the end of this, we do not have a double quote because when we turn the page, he's still speaking. And it says, I don't mind why you are not as tired. I don't understand why you are not as tired as I am. You look as if you could run a marathon right now. I feel as if I've been hit by a tra freight train. It's not fair that you have all this energy when my body is aching with bruises forming. Again, there's no double quote at the end of that paragraph. But when we start the next paragraph to show that he's still speaking, there is a double quote there. Okay. I was defending your honor. I might have gotten a little bruised up, but you know, I cannot stand to see anyone get bullied. I'm just hoping they learn their lesson and will be not and will not be bothering you anymore in the future or I will do it again. Now he's done speaking. Now we have that double quote at the end. Okay. So every time a person speaks, you have a new paragraph, even if it's one word, like a kid saying, I want this. And the mom says, no. And the kid says, why? And the mom says, I said so, that's why. <laughs> Each time you change characters, it's a new paragraph. So let's continue on with this. She sighed, I never wanted you to get hurt. New paragraph. He smiled, I'm not nearly as hurt as they were. New paragraph. Or their dog, she said. Yeah, I did not like to. I did not like it when their dog got hurt. I feel bad that happened. That dog was another innocent victim, he shook his head. That dog ran into the road because he was not watching it, she recalled. Still, I hate to see an animal get hurt, and it haunts my dreams to remember that poor animal getting hit by the car, he said. All right, single quotes. When do we use these? People love to misuse single quotes. Um, so they're really only used when one character speaks and quotes another 
person. Think of it like gossip. Well, she said, and then when I'm saying what another person says, that's when I use a quote. So it's a quote within a quote that uses a double quote or a single quote. Be sure both quotes appear at the appropriate marks and at the very end, if you're ending speaking where the other person's quote is ending, you're gonna use three. So let's see what that looks like. She sighed, double quote, because this is where she starts talking. I just cannot believe he said. Now when he starts quote talking, that's when that single quote comes in, right? Even with her body parts scattered across the road, my dog is prettier than you. Notice there's a single quote, because that's where that quoted quote ends, but she's still speaking. That really hurt my feelings. Plus, he didn't even seem upset that that dog was killed. We were more upset when he, than he was. And he even said, now she's quoting him again, so there's another single quote. I don't care about that mangy mutt. Now, she's done talking and she's done quoting him, so that's why we have that triple quote at the end. Okay, so whenever you're ending speaking and you're ending a quote at the same time, that's when you get that triple quotation. All right, let's talk about points of view real quick. First person point of view. I am the first person point of view. If I'm telling a story, I'm going to use pronouns like I, me, my, our, we, and I can tell you what I'm thinking and feeling, but I don't know what other people are thinking and feeling, unless I'm a psychic. All right. I was so upset about the dog dying, I had to at least scrape his body off the road and give it a proper burial. So that's first person point of view because we're using the words I. Second person point of view, you're the second person point of view. So using you, yours, and your, also when you're giving instructions and directions, when you're saying stuff like go to the store, it's understood that I'm telling you go to the store. So when you're having instruction manuals, recipe books, those are also second person point of view. You grabbed a shovel and gingerly lifted the dog's remain from the pavement. Digging a shallow grave, you placed the animal carcass in the hole and covered it. You hoped that no predators would disturb the grave, so you put a few rocks over it. So when I'm using you like that, I'm using second person point of view. Third person point of view, it's like the third person that joins the conversation. So he, she, it, they, whoever walks through the door next uses that third person point of view. So we're going to use um, stuff like they, he, she. Instead of using stuff like I, me, my, we, are, you, and yours, those are not used in the third person point of view because it's including you and I. So they, he, she, Dr. Smith, that's third person point of view. Okay. So <clears throat> there's three points of point of view and third person point of view. The third person objective tells only what is seen and hear, heard, not the inner thoughts or beliefs of a character. So if we see what somebody's thinking or feeling or believing, that is not objective, okay? Just what's around us. So example of objective, it was dark when he was walking, not being able to see, he stumbled and looked down. So notice we're using he, not I, me, or you. So third person omniscient, um, limited omniscient, sorry. Um, follows the inner thoughts of just one character. Um, so you're still using that he, she, it, they pronouns, but you're only describing what one character can think and see and feel. Think of Alice in Wonderland. We know what she's thinking and feeling. We don't necessarily know about the other characters, what they're feeling unless they tell us. So let's look at an example. He tripped over a rock and wondered why there was freshly dug dirt. He noticed drops of crimson on the ground and wondered if it was blood. Should he call the cops? So when we're saying wondered, now we're getting in his head. We're thinking what he's thinking. So that makes it limited because we're only talking about that one person. In full omniscient, third person omniscient, that is, think of omniscient like all-knowing, omni-knowing, only almost like a god, god-like character that knows everything about every character, the inner thoughts of all the characters, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, all that good stuff. If they're having a good day, bad day, knows all that. So you're still using those pronouns, he, she, it, and they. So let's look at an example of this. The officer arrived on the scene. Concerned about the call, he worried it might really be another homicide in the area. He didn't know if he could handle another one. And that is the first character. Now let's see a second character's thought. 
The youth saw the officer arriving and was slightly relieved as he did not want to dig into the bloody dirt to find what was lurking below. His concern must have shown in his eyes. The officer laid his hand on the youth's shoulder to comfort him. After some digging, the youth and the officer discovered the dog's remains. Both were relieved it was not human. Neither wanted to see a decomposing human corpse. So when we say both were relieved, now we're knowing what they're thinking and feeling, right? In both characters, so that much makes it full omniscient because we're getting into more than one character's thoughts. All right, we will continue on with some more eerily easy English. Thanks so much for joining us.